And so as we just demonstrated, by using the steady state approximation for this specific case where my rate constant for my second reaction was much, much larger than the rate constant for the first step of this multi-step reaction, then we had this process where we can much more easily solve for the integrated rate law expressions. And so there's, there's two additional questions that, that probably should be asked so that we can make sure that we're applying this correctly to the correct system. That first question that we should ask is, does this, or when does this apply? How do we know that it applies for this system? And the second one is, does the full solution, so the one that we calculated previously, does that result in the steady state approximation solution if we let the rate constant for the second reaction equal or be much, much, much larger than the rate constant for the first reaction. And so for this first question, when does the steady state approximation apply? Again, I mean, we can all imagine that, yes, this is a pretty important question to know the answer to if we're going to actually apply this effectively. And so this leads us back to, you know, evaluating what we calculated for our open circle DNA under this condition where we would say the rate of change is equal to zero. And so what that means is that I'm going to take the time derivative of what we calculated for our open circle DNA. And in this case, that is KF1 over KF2 times the initial concentration of the supercoiled DNA times E raised to the power of negative KF1 times T. And that then we're going to ask the question, under what condition does, does this value for our open circle DNA when is the time derivative of that equal to zero? And then that will give us an indication of on what orders of magnitude do our rate constants have to be for the steady state approximation to apply. So all that means is that I'm going to say zero is equal to and the time derivative of my concentration for my open circle DNA. Well, I have three constants, so I can just write them out front. I've got KF1 over KF2 times the initial concentration of my supercoiled DNA and the derivative of an exponent raised to the power of a negative constant times my independent variable. Well, in that case, I get minus kf1 times e raised to the power of negative kf1 times t. And so if I simplify this expression, what I get is 0 being equal to negative kf1 squared divided by kf2 times the concentration initially of the supercoiled DNA times e raised to the power of negative kf1 times t. And so looking at this, there are essentially two pieces to this expression. We have an exponential term, and then we have all the constants that are out in front. And looking at the exponential term, we know that this term will probably always be small. And I know that because I have e raised to the power of some constant times t. And so this term, this exponential term, will always decrease the value of my right hand side. And again, we're trying to get something and we're trying to understand the relationship between the first rate constant and the second rate constant and under those conditions when that's essentially equal to zero so that we can say when the steady state applies. And so we're not going to get any information out of the exponential term about that relationship. Where we get that information about the relationship between the two rate constants, which then lets the steady state approximation applies here with these constants. And what this tells us is that since we have the first rate constant on top and we have the second rate constant on the bottom, if the second rate constant is really, really, really big and the first rate constant is by comparison really, really, really small, then what that does is that that dramatically decreases this right-hand side and then essentially means that it's going to go closer and closer and closer to zero, notwithstanding the minus sign. And so what we can say about this in terms of trying to get an idea to quantify when the steady state applies, we would say that KF2, the second rate constant, has to be much, much, much bigger than KF1 squared times the concentration of, or the initial concentration of the supercoiled DNA. And for that reason, then what that would mean is that this term, these three constants, as they're multiplied and divided together, that would give us then a value that's then essentially equal to zero, which then, when weighted with my exponential term over here means that I will even get an even smaller number, or a number that's much, much, much closer to zero, which then allows us to then say, okay, the steady state approximation applies 
we have or we can apply it to this scenario. The second question that we should ask, and this is in order to ensure that the approximation that we just calculated is valid, is that we should compare it to the full solution, so this is the one that we calculated previously, um, and compare it or apply the steady state approximation, meaning that we have a second rate constant that's much, much, much larger than the first one, and see that if we recover the steady state approximation solution. So if you remember, what we calculated for the full solution was the concentration of L was equal to the initial concentration of the supercoiled DNA times 1 plus the first rate constant times E raised to the power of the negative of the second rate constant times time minus the second rate constant times E raised to the power of the negative of the first rate constant times time. And those two exponential terms were divided by the second rate constant minus the first rate constant. And what we're going to do with this expression is that we're going to assume that the second rate constant is much, much larger than the first rate constant. But it's also much, much larger than the first rate constant squared times the initial concentration of supercoiled DNA. This is our condition so that we can apply our steady state approximation. And so that's what we're going to assume here for our full solution. And the idea is that we should get back this expression, because this is the steady state approximation solution. So if we look at our full solution and we start applying the fact that we've got our second rate constant to be much larger than our first rate constant, then we have our concentration of our linear DNA is equal to the initial concentration of our supercoiled DNA. And I still have my 1 plus. And so the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to start crossing off terms here. And what that means is that in my denominator, I have kf2 minus kf1. And so I have the subtraction of two terms where we would say, or we're assuming that kf2 is much, much larger than kf1. So we're just going to cross off that term. When we look at the top, we have these two exponential terms times the two rate constants. In this first term, I've got kf1 times e raised to the power of negative kf2 times t. And then in the second term, I've got kf2 times e raised to the power of negative kf1 times t. And so if kf2 is much, much, much larger than kf1, then right here I've got constants that are out front where this term is going to be much, much, much greater, and this term is going to be much, much, much less. And then I also have an exponent that's raised to the power of a constant that is much, much, much greater, and on the second term it's much, much, much less. And so the combination of these two things means that when I have the subtraction of these two terms, the term that dominates is this second term. This is the one that dominates. So what I'm going to write in terms of my expression or my improved expression here is that since I have this negative term being the term that's dominant, then I actually have 1 minus kf2 times e raised to the power of negative kf1 times t divided by kf2. And then now that I have this expression, I can now cross off the kf2s because I have one on top and one on the bottom. And what that leaves me with is the concentration of my linear DNA is equal to the concentration initially of my supercoiled DNA times 1 minus e raised to the power of negative kf1 times t. And if you notice, that is exactly what I have from my steady state approximation when we went through the process just a second ago. And so again, this is a second helpful way to, to determine whether or not the approximation is valid is that if you take the solution, if you assume, or if you make no assumptions whatsoever and you have a full solution for it, if you start to apply the same approximation where we would say, yes, this rate constant is much bigger than some other rate constant and we can simplify the expression, if you recover what you had from the derivation from the approximation, then you know that you have an expression that, that is valid for that, that scenario. In this lecture, our objective was to quantify integrated rate law expressions for multi-step reactions. Here's a summary of what we covered. For consecutive reactions, rate laws are written as elementary reactions, whose order is from the stoichiometric coefficients of the balanced chemical reaction. Based on these rate law expressions, we can determine integrated rate law expressions.
Based on these integrated rate law expressions, we can determine when the concentration of an intermediate is at a maximum by solving for t when the rate of change of the intermediate with respect to time is equal to zero. The rate determining step is the step which dictates the speed of the overall reaction. Typically, this is the slowest step that also serves as a bottleneck in the reaction scheme. To simplify manipulating and analyzing rate law expressions, we examine two approximations. The first is when equilibria are present in a multi-step process, and the rate constants for the equilibrium reaction are much larger than the others involving the intermediate. In this case, it can be assumed that the system has a stable equilibrium. The second is if the consumption of an intermediate is much larger than its production. Then, the steady state approximation can be used in order to assume that the concentration of the intermediate does not vary with time.